the world's greatest empire. But it wasn't built in a day. The rise, the fall, the conquerors, the conquered, Rome. Hello, I'm Joe Mantegna. An ancient philosopher remarked that all roads lead to Rome. One time he was right. 2,000 years ago, all highways led to the most powerful empire known to man. The story of the Roman Empire begins with the tumultuous founding of the city by Romulus and Remus. It continues with the rise of Julius Caesar, Anthony and Cleopatra, Spartacus, and others. Larger than life figures born into a civilization teeming with brilliance, bravery, and sheer brutality. They were the most gifted men and women of their age, powerful, passionate and unyielding. For more than a thousand years, they ruled the Western world, conquering enemies, building opulent cities, and living lives of decadent grandeur. The Roman Empire has long captured the fantasies of the modern world. Hollywood has recreated Rome's pagan palaces and public revelry. Its cruel and cunning conquests and its insatiable lust for life. Remember, remember, I want you to forget me, please. Forget? How? I can never be more far away from you than this. The real Roman Empire could never be duplicated again. The ancient civilization stretched across three continents, from Britain down to North Africa, across Western Europe to parts of Asia, the Middle East, and beyond. It was an empire that set the standard for architecture, law, and military might. But it was the Roman people themselves, from countless countries and cultures, who personified the power and glory of the once thriving empire. The origins of this lost civilization are steeped in myth and legend. Most Romans believed their ancestry began along the banks of the Tiber River in a region now known as Italy. In the 8th century BC, the daughter of the Latin king Numitor bore twin sons named Romulus and Remus. But the king's brother feared the infants would cheat him out of the royal throne. In a fit of rage, he tossed the twins into the frigid river. Legend says the brothers were eventually rescued by a she-wolf who suckled them to health. By 753 BC, Romulus and Remus were grown men. They set the foundation of a new city called Rome. But the brotherly bond didn't last for long. Romulus killed Remus during a petty family quarrel, making Romulus the sole ruler of Rome. The followers of Romulus eventually settled on one of the seven hills that made up the new city. We're here in the Palatine, on the edge of the Palatine, overlooking the river, the Tiber River, with the Capitoline Hill to one side and the Aventine behind us. And the site of Rome is a function of the relationship between the river and between the various hills around it. The river controlled the crossing, any trade that was going north-south. The hills provided a naturally fortified place where people came together to put their communities up here on top of the hill. In ancient times, Italy was a region of great cultural diversity. Various tribes, such as the Greeks, Sabines, and Latins, 
eventually melded together to become one race of people, the Romans. The early Romans lived in small communities which grew into city-states. Most of these primitive people lived together in these surviving grass huts and were ruled by kings from the wealthiest families. But 50 years after Romulus founded his city, a growing tribe of people conquered the fractured communities and became the ruling monarchy. These were the Etruscans. The Etruscans were sophisticated people who created exquisite paintings and pottery. They also built elaborate burial tombs, for they believed in eternal life after death. But the Etruscans were also brutal rulers who rained terror upon the other Roman people. In 509 BC, after over 200 years of hostile oppression, a group of Roman aristocrats ousted the Etruscan monarchy. In its place, they created a new government, the Roman Republic, a republic that would grow beyond anyone's wildest dreams. It was the dawn of a new era. Gone were the days of tyrannical kings. The power was no longer in the hands of one person. The new government was run by two councils. These magistrates shared power over the Republic by making laws and overseeing legal cases. New councils were elected each year by a committee of senators who made decisions on government policy. The Roman Republic had two classes of citizens, the plebeians, Rome's general populace who were merchants, craftsmen, and farmers, and the patricians, the elite class who held political power. Like so much else that the Romans did, it was largely unplanned. There was no constitutional convention. There were no Jefferson or Madison or Franklin. There was no written document. The overthrow of the last Etruscan king meant that Rome established a republic. But the ironic thing about that is that the power of the consul, of each of the consuls, was basically modeled on that of the Etruscan king whom they'd overthrown. The difference was, and it's a major difference, is that there were two. The plebeians complained that the new system of government was not much better than the old system. Although plebeians were allowed to vote, only the patricians were allowed to run for political office. In 471 BC, the plebeians created a tribune in which 10 men were elected to represent their class against any political oppression by the consuls or patricians. In 450 BC, a system of laws called the 12 tables was set up to protect the rights of every citizen. Over the centuries, law became a prestigious profession. Cicero, a man from a modestly wealthy family, became one of Rome's most celebrated lawyers and orators. His parents were not noble, they were not in the Senate. He's one of the few people who manages to obtain that all on his own. He is the, the finest orator in Rome. He's the lawyer everyone wants. And in an age when everyone is being sued and litigated against for various reasons, Cicero is the man you go to. This makes him extremely valuable and an ally of all sorts of powerful people. Like a modern lawyer, Cicero was a crafty public defender who played up the drama in the courtroom. During one of his trials, he hired orphans off the streets to pose as the starving children of a woman he was defending against her husband. Cicero addressed the jury. I will focus only on my client's innocence today, and thus I will completely ignore the fact that the prosecutor in this case is an infamous philanderer who beats his wife and steals from innocent grandmothers. Hotshot attorneys demonstrated their merits by winning legal cases, but most Roman men would demonstrate their worth on the battlefield. From the fifth to the second century BC, Rome had expanded its influence beyond the borders of Italy. 
Each of the two councils built up a powerful army, divided into legions of men from various classes. The Roman legions evolved into the fiercest fighting machines the world had yet seen. In their initial quest to plunder territories of their wealth, these soldiers of fortune were on their way to Romanizing the world. Over time, the territories they conquered became provinces of Rome. As the Roman Empire expands, the provinces are always important because they bring in more booty. The Roman system is not, early on, is not to conquer, to make people citizens and to tax them. It's, it's to simply bleed the provinces for everything they possibly can, and all this wealth ends up back in Rome. By the second century BC, the Roman army had conquered most of the Mediterranean basin, including Greece, parts of North Africa, Spain, Asia, and the Middle East. Over time, the councils elected governors to oversee each province. Eventually, most of the people within the provinces were allowed to become Roman citizens. When the Romans conquered an area, what they would do was let the citizens of these conquered areas participate in measured ways in further Roman conquests. What the Romans did not do, and this sets them apart from other peoples in the ancient world, was tax the Italic peoples who they conquered. Instead, what they asked these communities to give was their sons. That is, the Romans asked for a certain number of troops to be provided each year to fight along with the Roman army under Roman command. But it also allowed the conquered peoples to participate in the success of war. That is, soldiers going out from these communities came home after their victories with booty, bringing new wealth in the community. Much of this wealth was brought back to Rome, the capital of the empire. Among the booty were marble statues and reliefs used to decorate the Forum, the civic center of the city. By 100 BC, the Forum was flowing with activity and excitement. Orators made public speeches in front of the Senate building. Citizens prayed and made sacrifices at the many public temples dedicated to their pagan gods, such as Jupiter, Minerva, and Apollo. The Forum blossomed into a monumental wonder, a true symbol of Rome's growing power and wealth. As you walk through the Forum, you wouldn't have seen what we often see in movies, this sort of pristine, white, sober landscape. You would have seen a, a riot of color, actually. We also have to remember that Rome was a vertical city. The Romans invented the skyscraper. It may have only been four or five stories tall, but many people lived in tenements that were at least that tall. To build these powerful cities, Rome needed manpower. While many of the people from conquered lands became citizens, many more were auctioned off as slaves. Thousands of these slaves were educated and secured positions as philosophers, musicians, dancers, and teachers. But tens of thousands more were forced into brutal manual labor. I'm standing in front of the quarries at Syracuse which are one of the largest stone quarries from the ancient world. The quarries were cut by the strokes of human hands, and each hand belonged to a slave. But the jobs that were most dangerous and no one else would do were the jobs that slaves had to do. These were places where people worked and were worked to death. Whenever we think about classical antiquity, whenever we think about what was produced, the wonderful buildings and the literature, we must realize that all of this was based upon slave labor. And it's appropriate that in front of the quarries, we have a capital carved from stone. So in one sense, you can see the architectural glory of the classical world, but we must always remember that it was based upon the labor of slaves. At times, these slaves could have the whole might of the Roman army focused on them. Of the many slave revolts of the time, the largest took place on the Italian peninsula. The rebellion was instigated by a slave named Spartacus, who was forced to fight as a gladiator, a dangerous sport 
where slaves fought slaves to the death for the public's amusement. No longer willing to risk his life in the gladiatorial arena, Spartacus escaped and gradually assembled tens of thousands of slaves to join forces with him. For two years, they held off the Roman army and plundered the Italian countryside. Spartacus's slave revolt, I think, is very important in the way that Romans think about slaves. It was the most dangerous of the slave revolts. It took two or three Roman legions to suppress it, and it reminded the Romans that those slaves who peopled their household, against whom they passed rub shoulders in the street, could, and perhaps wanted to, murder them in their beds. The Spartacus slave revolt is an enormous trauma for Republican Rome. This is an enormous embarrassment and humiliation because of the idea of a slave army beating a Roman army is unthinkable in Rome. To save face, Rome's consul sent two of their most celebrated commanders to hunt down the rebels. Crassus, a wealthy seasoned general, and Pompey, a gifted warrior whose military conquests garnered him the title Pompey the Great. I think once you've been named the Great at the age of 25, I think that probably defines your character for the rest of your life. He was not a man who had any patience at all with the forms of the Senate. He didn't come from a noble family, so that he actually had to have friends make cheat books for him as to how the Senate worked and the procedure. In 72 BC, Crassus, with the help of Pompey, commanded 40,000 men to hunt down Spartacus and his renegade slaves. Within a year, most of the slaves were cornered and killed. But Spartacus and 6,000 slaves were taken prisoner and crucified. The crosses stretched for miles along the Appian Way, Rome's major thoroughfare. Crucifixion was a fairly common form of execution in antiquity, and it's quite clear that people would indeed live for some considerable time in this excruciating agony until eventually they effectively died of, of suffocation because it was more difficult for them to make the necessary movements to keep breathing. So eventually they would suffocate and, and the bodies would be left there to decay by the roadside as a, a warning to others. The Spartacus revolt marked the last epic slave war of the ancient world. Crassus and Pompey were made consuls in Rome. Their victory gave them enormous control over the Senate. But in time, Pompey and Crassus would eventually lose their power to a man who would rule the entire Roman world. In the first century BC, the Roman Empire would witness the rise of one of history's greatest leaders. It was said that in war, no one surpassed him, in love, no one matched him. And in time, his name would come to symbolize absolute power. His birth name was Gaius Julius Caesar, but he would eventually be known as dictator of the Mediterranean world. He was born into a patrician family in 100 BC. His parents were harsh disciplinarians who beat their son frequently as a way of whipping him into manhood. Caesar grew up to be tall and muscular with nerves of steel. His physical vanity was openly expressed as well as his insatiable drive to succeed. At age 18, Caesar enlisted in the army and quickly rose to the rank of military commander. He was determined to make his mark on Rome and the world. Julius Caesar is driven by ambition, pure and simple. This is a quest for power. This is a quest to out Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, of course, had conquered most of the known world by the time he was 30. There's a famous story of Julius Caesar in Spain seeing a statue of Alexander the Great and bursting into tears, saying, I am only 25 and I have not yet conquered anything. And I think it was this burning ambition, not only to be as powerful as possible, but also in memory, in history, to stand above Alexander the Great. Julius Caesar demanded unwavering loyalty from his soldiers, who were paid handsomely for their services. 
Caesar's first military conquest was capturing Spain in 61 BC. His brutal tactics on the battlefield made him a dangerous threat to the Senate back in Rome. The Republican senators reluctantly rewarded Caesar by electing him as one of Rome's co-consuls. But even this position didn't satisfy him. Caesar wanted even more control over the Senate, who considered him a power-hungry warlord. In 60 BC, Caesar petitioned Rome's former co-consuls, Pompey and Crassus, to form a three-way leadership within the Republic. With Crassus's money and Pompey's military influence, Caesar was able to overthrow all senatorial opposition. The three men created Rome's first triumvirate. Caesar sealed the deal by allowing Pompey to marry his daughter, Julia. Caesar proved to be as shrewd in the political arena as he had been on the battlefield. He positioned himself as man of the people, going into the slum neighborhoods of Rome to support the poor. This was less a virtuous act and more a political tool used against the conservative senators who still treated him as an outsider, driven by his own self-interests and not the interests of the Republic. The citizens of Rome, I think, played an important part in Caesar's political ambitions. They, along with the army, were a significant element in the formation of his power base. He was always sure and certain that he wanted the support of the Roman people and that he was always going to make sure that they were on his side. He spent some considerable effort, often through the organization of mob violence, to make sure that the city of Rome was always backing him. The three rulers split up the empire equally. After their one-year term in office, Crassus and Pompey went their separate ways. But Caesar now used his political clout to do as he pleased. He bribed the new co-consuls of Rome to provide him with an army big enough to conquer the massive region of Gaul, now modern France. For nine years, between 58 and 50 BC, Caesar led several legions into Gaul, crushing the opposition. Along the way, Caesar and his army became extremely wealthy, plundering Gaul of its riches. But the toll in human suffering was enormous. Caesar was responsible for the death or enslavement of over a million persons. The Romans had never been easy on defeated enemies, but Caesar took it to a new scale. So if we look at Caesar as one of the great men of history, we must also consider him one of the great killers of history. Caesar's conquest of Gaul was another pivotal moment in Roman history. He now had the army and wealth from the spoils of war to defeat anyone opposing him, including his former partners Crassus and Pompey, who both envied his success. Crassus was eventually killed in the Battle of Carrhae, fighting the Parthians. His head was subsequently used in a Greek play put on by the Parthian king. Back in Rome, the two new co-consuls for the year 50 BC were hostile to Caesar. Pompey even distanced himself from Caesar by supporting his opponents in the Senate. The crisis came about in 49 when Caesar wished to return to Rome to run for office once again. His opponents would not let him run for office um, in absentia. He claimed this was a negation of his rights. And in 49, he invaded Italy. Caesar declared civil war on Rome. He rode with his legions to the Rubicon, the river that separated Italy from Gaul. There, Caesar addressed his men. Let us accept this as a sign from the gods and follow what they call in vengeance on our treacherous enemies. The die is cast. In 49 BC, Caesar crossed the Rubicon and seized control of Italy. Pompey had fled Rome and mobilized his men in Pharsalus, Greece. Caesar hunted down his former partner 
and waged a decisive attack. Pompey's men, many of whom were intimidated by Caesar's seasoned troops, deserted him in droves. After a vicious clash, Caesar was victorious. Pompey, who survived the bloodbath, quickly fled to Egypt with Caesar in pursuit. Upon his arrival in the seaport city of Alexandria, Egypt, Caesar was greeted by the 10-year-old Egyptian king, Ptolemy XIII, who presented him with a gift, the head of Pompey, a goodwill gesture from the citizens of Egypt to the hero of Rome. Egypt was an enormously wealthy place, very, very much worth having, but in political anarchy. For many, many years, the Romans left it that way. They left it that way because they didn't trust any particular Roman aristocrat to go out there and deal with Egypt. It was too rich and too dangerous. Caesar, when he got there, saw what the situation was and decided that he would stabilize the country. Egypt was looking for military support from Rome, but Caesar was more interested in another kind of alliance. He would soon find himself in partnership with King Ptolemy's sister. Her name was Cleopatra. In 51 BC, Julius Caesar found himself in the middle of a family feud. The Egyptian king, Ptolemy XII, had willed his throne to his 10-year-old son, Ptolemy XIII and his 18-year-old daughter, Cleopatra. Of Egypt's co-rulers, Cleopatra was the gifted one. She was a witty and highly educated woman for her time, who felt comfortable in the company of powerful men. But deceit and deception loomed inside the palace walls. Ptolemy eventually had Cleopatra exiled from the city in an attempt to seize total power. When Cleopatra heard that Caesar was in Alexandria, she was determined to meet with him. The city was still in the hostile hands of her brother's supporters, so the queen smuggled herself back into Alexandria, wrapped up in an oriental carpet. The 50-year-old Caesar was impressed by the sly and intelligent 18-year-old queen who unraveled before him. The two formed an alliance and subsequently crushed Ptolemy and his supporters. Caesar and Cleopatra began a toward love affair. They spent weeks taking romantic sunset cruises down the Nile. Cleopatra soon became pregnant with Caesar's son. Caesar was eventually forced to leave his Egyptian mistress. Duty called him to command another war in Asia Minor. In 47 BC, Caesar's armies sacked the Pharnakes at the Battle of Zella. It was there he cried out his famous creed, Vini, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. In 46 BC, Julius Caesar rode back to Rome in a triumph. Cleopatra and their infant son she named Caesarion accompanied him. The Roman people made the 54-year-old war hero dictator of Rome, a position citizens voted on only in times of civil war or other political crises. But while Caesar was being honored, his new mistress Cleopatra was being looked upon with suspicion. Cleopatra was viewed as a threat to Roman society because she opposed all that decent Roman womanhood stood for. She was renowned for her sexual license and her sexual practices. It was as though the Roman matron, solidly in her domestic setting in Rome, was threatened by this Eastern siren. Cleopatra was bad news. This had not been the first time Caesar had taken up a mistress. Although he was married to his third wife, Calpurnia, adultery was legal for men as long as the woman wasn't married and Caesar took full advantage of his liberties. Julius Caesar, apart from being a great politician, a great military man, a great administrator, seems also to have been a very great womanizer. 
Caesar's reputation for his affairs with women, for being a real ladies' man, was so great that in his last years, there was a proposal that Caesar be given the right, the privilege, the possibility of having a sexual relationship with any woman he chose, as many women as he chose. And this surely, even if the story isn't true, is a reflection on the reputation Caesar had. I think Caesar must have been a very sexy man. That there, there are stories when he was on campaign that the soldiers would sing a song as he was going into a town and they would say, men, lock up your wives because Caesar is on his way. I think a man who had such extraordinary power as Caesar is an attractive proposition for many women. More than his love for women, Caesar had an unyielding drive to show off his power. Bypassing Senate approval, he launched numerous reform programs, including the cancellation of farmers' debts. An intellect and visionary, he also instituted the Julian calendar of 365 and one-fourth days. The month of July was even named in honor of his first name, Julius. Rome's lower classes applauded his efforts to improve their lives. To them, he could do no wrong. In 45 BC, in an unprecedented show of gratitude, the Roman citizens voted the 54-year-old Caesar dictator for life. He was now an even bigger threat to the old Roman establishment, namely the senators, who feared he was wielding too much power. Once he's become dictator, I, I think there is probably a change in, in his personality in a way. I think when a man attains that kind of glory and magnitude, I think he begins to sort of look down on institutions like a senate and a republic and thinking perhaps he does know best. Caesar's reckless use of power would eventually do him in. A group of senators led by Cassius and Caesar's close friend Brutus plotted his demise. Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, warned him about a dream she had that he would be assassinated, but he disregarded her warnings. On the Ides of March in 44 BC, Caesar strolled to the Senate building. He casually entered the Senate chambers, unaware of his impending doom. Then suddenly, the assassins attacked. A mob of senators repeatedly stabbed Caesar with their daggers. The violent act was frenzied and gruesome. After enduring 27 fatal blows, Caesar finally covered his face with his toga so no one could see him die. News of Caesar's assassination roused chaos in the streets of Rome. The assassins came out of the Senate chambers crying, Liberty! But many of Caesar's supporters were angered by his murder. Mark Antony, Caesar's deputy at the time, made an emotional plea before the Roman people to give their fallen leader a public burial. Mark Antony's speech was such that the crowd, when they saw Caesar's body, rioted grabbed his body and decided to cremate it themselves. So they took it down here to the other end of the forum and cremated the body right on this spot. Soon afterwards, a popular cult grew up around the spot where the body was cremated. A monument was raised, and if we walk in, we can see the remains of the altar, which to this day is uh, venerated by Romans, or at least some Romans. Flowers are placed in the grave, particularly celebrating the uh, Ides of March, uh, by monarchists who revere the memory of Caesar the dictator. In death, Julius Caesar became a Roman icon despite his detractors. Temples were built in his name where he remained chief priest or pontiff maximus. He was even declared by some to be a god. Caesar symbolizes, I think, one good thing and one bad thing. He symbolizes the new political state of the Roman Empire, the idea of an empire ruled by an emperor. And after all, all emperors through to Justinian will call themselves Caesar. 
and Julius Caesar becomes something that is also very threatening to all subsequent Roman emperors. They remember that in that drive to become a monarch, Julius Caesar was brutally assassinated. That image hung like a dark cloud over emperors for the next six centuries. Caesar helped to Romanize the world, but he also left the Roman Republic in turmoil. The infighting within the Senate brought the government to a standstill. There was also the problem of how to handle the ever-growing population of people. The Republic was in desperate need of a new leader. Amidst the chaos following Julius Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, all of Rome was anxious to find out who would become his successor. Cleopatra had bore Caesar his only son, Caesarian. Mark Antony, Caesar's deputy, had positioned himself as rightful heir. But even in death, Caesar had his way on Roman politics. In his will, he had posthumously adopted his sister's grandson. The unknown 19-year-old, Gaius Octavius, was to become heir to Caesar's estate and Rome. He only found about his adoption when Caesar was assassinated because it was in the will. It took considerable courage to come to Rome to claim his inheritance, but come to Rome he did. And he immediately began politicking, insinuating himself with the troops, uh, playing a double game against Mark Antony in the one hand and against the conservatives in the other. So you have a fellow in the person of Octavius who began his career as a young demagogue, managed through a name alone to gain control of an army. Octavius, better known as Octavian, was a physically weak and spoiled adolescent who was inexperienced when it came to matters of government. He faced immediate opposition from Mark Antony, a brash military commander who had proven his loyalty to Caesar in several key battles. But Antony also had a reckless side. Antony had a tremendous reputation for very, very wild living. Wild orgies, drinking parties, all night revels, sexual activities with both men and women, we have a very violent attack against all aspects of Antony's private life as well as his public life by the great orator and politician Cicero, who calls Antony a drink-sodden, sex-ridden wreck. One particular incident where Antony had a meeting, a political meeting in the morning, he was so hungover by the extraordinary excesses of the night before that he actually attended the meeting, still drunk, still hungover, and vomited up into his toga in the middle of the meeting. Octavian would one day use Antony's unruly behavior to his advantage. The teenager was ambitious and cunning. He realized he needed to form an alliance with Mark Antony in order to seize total power over the empire. Octavian plotted his future. He created Rome's second triumvirate, sharing the power with Mark Antony and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who had been a provincial governor. Lepidus soon fell out of the three-way coalition, which left Octavian and Antony to divide up the empire. Octavian took charge of the provinces of the West, which included Spain, Italy, and Gaul. Mark Antony commanded the eastern provinces of North Africa, and Asia. Following in Caesar's footsteps, Antony eventually formed an alliance with the Egyptian queen, Cleopatra. The first great meeting between uh, Antony and Cleopatra is the famous one that took place in what is now the south coast of Turkey. Cleopatra, obviously by now a much more experienced woman, not as when she first met Caesar, sailing up the river in a, in a great boat that was decorated with gold and purple drapes. She herself was supposed to have been dressed as the goddess Venus. There were musicians, there were perfumes, and that she sailed along the river to meet Antony, a great spectacle. Her rowers caressed the water with oars of silver, which dipped in time to the music of the flute. 
Plutarch. Cleopatra was no longer grieving over the loss of Julius Caesar. The Egyptian queen fell madly in love with the ambitious Mark Antony. With her relationship with Julius Caesar, Cleopatra not only learned about love, but also learned how to manipulate powerful Roman generals. She learned a catalog of exercises, sexual and political, which enabled her to ensnare Mark Antony. Of course, these things go both ways. The important thing about Julius Caesar, Mark Antony and Cleopatra is that they all knew precisely what they were doing. If they fell in love, if they went to bed together, they all did it knowingly. This was a relationship between powerful individuals who all knew what the game was. Well, the liaison between Antony and Cleopatra, of course, is one of the most celebrated relationships in all of history. But what's more interesting is that Antony left Egypt after that, did not see Cleopatra again for four years. Obviously, he wasn't pining away for her. In fact, he got married during that time to Octavian's sister, Octavia. Mark Antony had hoped that his marriage to Octavia would assure loyalty from Octavian. But Antony eventually left his wife and returned to Alexandria to seal a political deal with Cleopatra. The two lovers planned to oust the young Octavian and rule the Western world together. However, their partnership provided Octavian with the opportunity he had been looking for. Octavian spearheaded a ruthless propaganda campaign. He told the Roman people that Cleopatra had cast a spell over Antony, that the two lovers spent their time having lavish banquets and orgies, that Antony was willing to give her half the Roman world. Octavian's smear campaign worked. The Roman citizens supported Octavian's decision to declare war on Antony and Cleopatra. In the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, Octavian's military defeated Antony's and Cleopatra's ships on the Mediterranean Sea. The two lovers managed to escape the naval battle unharmed and retreated to Egypt. Antony and Cleopatra knew Octavian's men would come after them. In his final act, Antony retired to his chambers, drew his sword, and stabbed himself in the chest. His suicidal death was slow, painful. When Cleopatra learned that Antony had taken his life, she decided to end hers. The Egyptian queen wrapped a poisonous snake around her arm and received a lethal bite. In a sense, both Mark Antony and Cleopatra commit suicide in order to preserve their reputations. It would have been much worse for them if, for example, they had appeared in Octavian's triumph in Rome. They both make the most decent, the most noble exit from the political stage that they possibly can under the circumstances. With Antony and Cleopatra dead, Octavian's henchmen murdered Caesar's only son, Caesarian. Now, no one stood in Octavian's way. The Roman Republic had crumbled. In its place, Octavian helped establish a new government, the Imperial Roman Empire. Octavian saw his dream come to fruition. He became Rome's first emperor and sole ruler of the most powerful nation the ancient world had ever known. Octavian's ascension to the imperial throne was a dramatic turning point. He was given a new title, Augustus, which meant semi-divine. To the Roman people, Augustus became the closest thing to God on earth. His power and prestige would transform the empire into a golden age, a time of endless possibilities, when being Roman meant everything. For the History Channel, I'm Joe Mantegna.